Testament, you have everything you need, right? Do you have a copy of the service? Gotcha. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Whether you're joining us from the social hall, the parking lot over FM radio, or in Facebook land, we welcome you to Central United Methodist Church. I'm Debbie Roop, and I'm kind of helping out Pastor Brad this morning. He is doing fine, but he had a fever due to a shingles vaccine, and as a precaution, his doctor felt that he should have a COVID-19 test, and he is in testing quarantine right now, awaiting his results, and we pray for good news on that. So rest assured, though, I'm not going to preach. <laughs> <laughs> so we are blessed to have Reverend Burt Kaufman with us this morning, so please stay tuned. Don't turn the dial. Don't jump off of Facebook. But I am glad you're here this morning, and we're going to start off with our prelude.
Let us pray. Oh Lord, we come to you this morning scattered when we would prefer to be gathered. We miss the smiles, we miss the handshakes and hugs, but you are with us and you've promised to be with us no matter where we are, from the highest to the lowest, from the east and from the west. We pray this morning for our broken world. There are forest fires and hurricanes. There are all sorts of things that threaten us, but you have promised to be with us and that we are not alone. We thank you for being here. We pray that Pastor Brad will feel comforted by the love of this congregation and you, and that we will soon gather once again in your name. Thank you for being here, Lord. Help us to worship. In Christ's name, amen. Now we're going to sing a favorite call to worship. Victory in Jesus. for you this morning and it's really going to be sweet how about that today I want to talk about being thankful hmm when someone gives you a birthday present Aurelia what do we say to them 
thank you is the correct answer. Well, when someone does something nice for your mom, what do we say? <laughs> thank you again. I'm sorry I didn't get to hear that response. I think it was funny. <laughs> but thank you is the correct answer again. You know, we talk about thank being thankful a lot at Thanksgiving, don't we? But you know what? That's crazy because we should be thankful every single day. Have any of you thanked God today? Have you? That's exactly what we do. We should do that before we get out of bed because he presented us another nice sunshiny day. So that's something we need to do every day, even a couple times a day. But I want to show you something. Does anybody know what this is? A donut. A donut. That's correct. I told you it was going to be a sweet message. I have a little rhyme that I want you to kind of remember. And it goes something like this. As you go through life, make this your goal. Look at the donut and not the hole. Say that with me again. As you go through life, make this your goal. Look at the donut and not the hole. I'd really like to quit right now and go ahead and eat this, but I won't. Sometimes we focus on everything we don't have instead of what we have. Some people would have looked and said, there's a hole there. I want the rest of that donut. They forgot that the other part is big and juicy and has chocolate icing on it. We need to think about that. We need to focus on the things in our life that we have. The next time you get upset and you kind of throw a little fit because you want something when you probably already have it at home stop and say that little rhyme and be thankful for the many many things you have at home this just isn't for kids this is for you adults as well sometimes we forget every day to be thankful for our blessings so let's have a little prayer dear God you bless us in so many ways. Help us to say thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us. And let us focus on what we have instead of what we don't have. We thank you most of all for your love. And in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, it's time for offering. There will be a box passed around or... If Yes, if Dawn, would you like to pass that around? And also, I know people in the parking lot can give. There's many ways to give. You can call the office, and you can mail a check in. There's debit, debits on your card you can make. There's, very, there's a very lot of ways to do this. So we would still appreciate the giving in these hard times. OK. Let's go ahead and do the doxology this morning. Next, we have two songs to lead us into our worship. What is it? Okay. Before we do that, let's bow our heads and have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us to, to temptation and deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, last week we talked about um, you all sending in your suggestions and songs that you would like to sing. And so we had um, several come in, one of which was Bless the Lord, O My Soul, which we did this morning. And the other one um, was Who You Say I Am. Both of these we've done before, um, but we're going to do them again today. So please send in your comments or email me or email Will Marple or Pastor Brad, and we will try our best to sing those songs. Um, sometimes they're not conducive for a small group, so if we can't sing them, please understand, but we will do our very best. Okay, so um, Who You Say I Am, we're going to sing first, and then we're going to do a new one after that called I Am Not Alone. And um, Pastor Kaufman prayed that in his prayer this morning, and I think during this time of all times, it's amazing to know that we are never alone, that Jesus walks beside us, and through everything we go through, he is right there. He's been to the future and back. He knows the beginning from the end, and we can rest assured in that. All right, sing along, clap along. Um, who you say I am?
think we all can agree that it sounds better from a lot of people than just me up here. So <laughs> get a hold of me if you are interested in doing that. All right, I am not alone.
these plastic shields are very helpful and I appreciate their purpose. It does remind me of the scripture, however, when Paul said, I see through a glass darkly. Between these screens and your masks, I have no idea who you are, but uh, I know many of you and I greet you this morning. Paul wrote a letter to the Romans in which he indicated that we have a choice about how we deal with what happens in the world. In the 12th chapter of Romans, the first two verses, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We give thanks for God's word to us, especially in our time of stress and trial. Paul points out that we can conform to this world, which is what most people do and what we're often tempted to do, or we can become transformed. And I think we're facing some challenges today that make the temptation to conform even stronger. The first one, most obviously, is COVID. We deal with it every day, almost every minute, in some way or another, it affects us. Whether we can go to work, when school's gonna start, whether they'll be able to play sports, we can't visit people in the hospital, so many things affect us. And we're tempted at one end of the continuum in conforming to be fearful, because that's what a lot of people are, and that's what some people try to stir up in others. We have conspiracy theories that China did this to us deliberately, or that if we ever get a vaccine, Bill Gates will slip something into our bodies that will control us like robots. There's no end of the kind of things people have come up with to make us afraid. But at the other end of conforming is trivializing. This isn't real, or if it's real, it's not serious. All the way through that continuum, we have the option of conforming to what the world tells us in so many different ways. You can be on Facebook, you can be on the telephone, and there are all kinds of ways to say you should be afraid or you should disregard it all. But being transformed means that we look for a solution. We've already discovered the code of this virus And that gives us the possibility of developing a way to resist it. Even now, they're working on vaccines that will be able to attack the virus that threatens us all. We also need, in the meantime, to be able to contain the spread, our masks, the screens here, the various ways we say we're going to keep it under control until we can defeat it. Our cooperation right now is our main weapon. But there have also been ways that people have been transformed by this COVID virus in ways that wouldn't have happened otherwise. I know a small church that thought we can't get together to worship, what are we going to do? They didn't have the technology to be able to do things But the old pastor there, and I say old, he was almost as old as me, he could use his smartphone and he could get on Facebook. And between the two, he set the phone up here and he talked and he preached and he discovered that he had twice as many people participating in his worship as he'd ever had before. He discovered that the shut-ins and others in the community that couldn't get to church found an open door for themselves there. And by that connection, they said, 
COVID will be over someday, but please don't stop. Include us. I know a medium-sized church that felt really disappointed that they would lose connection with all their people, so they made a point of getting people to call one another. And people were surprised. They were so used to doing things like going to church, going to meetings, that when somebody reached out to them, it was so incredibly joyful that they said, when we come back together, please don't stop the calling. I know a large church that decided to have a Zoom class. One of the members had a daughter in from California. She went with her dad to the class, and it was so touching to her and so informative. And she had to go back to California for her work, but she said, please don't lose the connection don't stop doing this so that I can stay connected with what's going on there. I got an email this week from a large church that does a leadership conference. It's a wonderful conference. They have it every year. Some people from Fairmont have been there in the past, but it's expensive. They have to pay travel expenses for their speakers. They have to pay living expenses, hotels and meals. They have to cover all of that, and each individual also has to have travel expenses and costs while they're there. So most people can't afford to go. But this year they're offering it online at a cost of about $40. And the whole staff and clay members, everybody can be a part of that. And people are saying, please don't stop. What you've had to do here can be a choice to do later. Solutions, being transformed rather than giving in and simply conforming to what we see around us. We're also dealing as a nation and indeed as a world with racism. If we conform at one end, we'll give in to fear. People are different from us. It's hard to trust people who are different. It's easier to stay apart and stay afraid. At the other end, we pretend that we're not racist. We call ourselves colorblind. It's really not an issue for now. It happened a long time ago. We should just forget about it. But I don't identify myself as not a racist. I'm a recovering racist. When I was probably seven years old, I listened to the boys and the girls around me in school, and one day I used a racial epithet, a slur, because I'd heard the other boys using it. I didn't think anything about it, but at recess, my teacher called me over and said, that's not a nice word. That can hurt other people. And I was stunned. I was only seven years old, but to think that I had done something that now I could see as being a harmful act. That stayed with me, that sense of what I do affects other people. Until I was in fifth grade and there was a boy in our class who was mixed racially. His dad was in prison, came from a bad part of town. I'd never really seen him before, but he came by where I used to play out back. I'd, <clears throat> I had a very small yard, but I loved archery. And so I would stand across two lots and an alley and shoot at a target on the wall on the third building. It's a wonder I didn't kill somebody, that kind of thing, but <clears throat> it was what I had to do and it was what I enjoyed. And Roger came by. And we got to talking, and I listened to him as another human being, as somebody who was experiencing life from a very different place than I was. But I didn't offer to let him use my bow. I went as far as I could, 
but it didn't occur to me to give up that trusted bow that had been my Christmas gift. And on my 10th birthday in fifth grade, Roger went swimming in the Tigert River. His little sisters were with him, but he lost control. He was going under. There were houses right there, but the little girls have been taught you don't go to houses where there are white families. They ran all the way home. And by the time help got there, he had drowned. It was a powerful effect on me because I said to myself, I didn't let him shoot my bow. Another boy from a very similar background and racial mix, Bobby, happened into my life about that time, and I made sure Bobby shot my bow. Every time an experience came along, I tried to listen to what was going on and to begin to grow. That's why I say, I can't say I'm not a racist, but I'm trying to recover. I'm trying to listen to the stories that will tell me about the people who have had a very different experience in the world from me. And then this week, there was an event that was you may have read about in the paper one of our city council members posted on Facebook a comment <clears throat> that said Vice President Biden should not have restricted himself for a vice presidential candidate to a black woman, that that overlooked a lot of qualified candidates. And then in the second sentence, he used a racial slur As a city council member, he was approached about that, and he withdrew the post, apologized on Facebook, and came with Mayor, uh, our Mayor Brad Merrifield, to the council that is the uh, Ministerial Alliance, a group of black and white pastors who have been meeting the last couple of months and he stood before them and apologized for the term that he had used. He said, a Christian should not use such words. But he said, but I do justify my first comment. It was wrong for Joe Biden to overlook all white people and, and men to choose. And Pastor... Leo Riley stood up and said, so you're saying that it was wrong for him to pass over qualified people because of the color of their skin? He said, yes. And Leo said, it's been happening to us for 200 years. The man said at the beginning of his talk, I am not a racist. But we are. We can conform to the world and give in to our prejudices, or we can despair and dismiss them, or we can be transformed by the renewing of our spirits to continue to be educated. I'm in the middle of a book now, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I want to learn. I want to hear the perspectives. I want to listen to people and to begin to put myself in the place of others and how they experience life. Well, I alluded to the third challenge, the election. As citizens of the United States, we're faced with choosing between candidates who talk about different things. <clears throat> if we simply conform then we'll listen to one of the theories about how if the other person gets elected, it'll be the end of life as we know it. You've seen that. You've heard that. We did survive eight years of Obama and four years of Trump. I think we'll survive regardless of who was elected. We don't need to give in to fear and worry that things are going to be destructive. But at the other end, we don't need 
to say they're all crooks, I'm not going to vote, it doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference. And between those extremes, there's a possibility of doing more than just despairing or more in believing that the end of the world is here. We can be transformed. We can ask ourselves what our core values are. For instance, somebody offers you an investment for your retirement. First year guaranteed 20%. Within two to three years, your investment will double. That's a very encouraging thing for your security. But you learn that that investment will pollute the water supply for Fairmont. Now you've got a value conflict. What do you do? I hope we would all choose not to pollute our water system. But that's an individual choice about competing values. Security, on one hand, good investment, valuing the lives of others and even yourself on the other. If we clarify our values that way to say what really does matter, we'll have a better view of how we want to vote. Not because everybody else has told us that this is going to be awful the other way, but because we have chosen a candidate that reflects the values that we share. What matters? Then finding what people as candidates truly believe. Not listening to what somebody on Facebook said they would mean, but listening to what the candidate's words are and seeing what the candidate's actions are. Looking at a life lived. And then realize that when you do vote, it's an imperfect choice. It's not what many would paint and say, it's black and white, it's all or nothing. It's a matter of saying, these are human beings, who represent various things, who've made various choices in their lives. And this is my imperfect choice to support this particular direction. Being transformed. Conforming is easy. Transformation takes searching and hard work and prayer. Don't stop listening. Don't stop growing, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Let us pray. Oh Lord, things are hard sometimes for us. We can't count on health. We can't count on wealth. We can't count on the way things used to be. And as we look around us, we see people making choices that are very destructive. Help us not to give up, to give in to fears, or to give in to just thinking nothing will happen. Help us instead to allow you to transform our minds and our lives and our decisions. You have promised that your ways are higher than our ways. Help us look to them as we make our difficult choices. In Christ's name, amen.
Benediction is a Latin word that means the good word. And the good word is that God is with us. We will survive the pandemic. We will overcome racism. We'll get on the other side of the election. And God is with us always. Go in that promise. Amen.